Chris, fantastic to have you back. Brilliant to get the podcast back flowing again. Really, really excited for people to hear about what you have to speak about today and uh, the way I'm going to try to direct this, this podcast. I really feel that every single person that listens to it, regardless of if they're doing their leaving cert, if they're in first or sixth year, if they're in college or even even me, will benefit from the answers of the questions that I'm going to ask you. So, Seth, you know, thanks for coming back. Dave, it's such an honor to be back on the show. I mean, at this stage, your star has risen so much since we last spoke, and I'm honored to be even thought of as a guest. You know, I know you're getting spotted in the street. People are asking for autographs. You know, your life's yeah. changed a lot since we last spoke. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I mean there, was a, there was a talk I was at the other day, uh, and a certain, a certain person actually shouted me out and asked to be on the podcast in front of hundreds of people. Now, get granted, that was a graduation, and she may have been slightly slagging me but you know that, that's the way that's the way it is but uh no it's fantastic uh, and it's great to have you on and it is at the odd time uh so, some people are a little bit inside their shell about wanting, wanting to come on that that's that's fair enough they're not too sure what they're getting into but uh, i think they're they're slightly scared that i might slag them on air but obviously i could never slag you on air or uh i might not have a job and that's that's a, that's okay no any answer right so uh uh, what, what we're gonna what we're gonna do here is I, I'm gonna ask you a little bit about your journey. I really want to think that people are gonna benefit from hearing about what what you were like in school to where you are now. Um, and the first thing, just to compare it all the way back, I, I I know a little bit about this. What was your school experience like? And can you tell me about your your personal leaving cert journey and how how maybe you navigated the waters of that or how you uh, like what what you learned from it and. and what brought you into college so just school itself yeah I was a fantastically ordinary student in school all the way through uh, I actually went to Wesley College for secondary school really enjoyed it had a great experience there it's, it's a great school with a great ethos and you know great student body uh, you know going through it academically I was middle of the road pretty much my entire time there every single one of my school reports would come home with the exact same comments on it could try harder, you know, loses focus in class, has the ability to do better, but, you know, isn't effectively. So that was kind of all the way through school, except for a couple of subjects. I always leaned towards the maths and kind of sciences. That was something I was just, I felt naturally better at than uh, the likes of English or languages in general, which I was really atrocious at, which I think looking back now was more of a problem with my attitude toward them than anything else. Um, but you know, I had a really, really good experience certainly in school. Uh, junior cert was grand, like like anything. Like it's, it was stressful at the time. Looking back, it's kind of funny to think that. I think a lot of people think it's very important when you're sitting through it and you're 15 or 16. You think the world's going to end. You don't do well. Enough. The thing is, the world didn't end, which is great. And um, but you know, then I went into fourth year. Like everyone in fourth year, you kind of have a bit of a coast dossing year kind of but you do grow socially i think i think there is benefit uh and warrant for it you know it certainly was where i went to school then going to fifth year took me ages to get back into the swing of things you know for example like my maths fell down so much because in fourth year you don't really do any of it so i found it quite hard getting back into a regime of working hard being diligent in class doing homework studying for tests and so on i remember then when i came to the end of fifth year you know, all my tests were very ordinary, didn't do great in particularly anything. And I remember uh, two incidents that happened to me. Number one was my English teacher at the time pulled me aside and said, Chris, you know, I'm not sure you're able for higher level English. And I think you should consider doing ordinary next year at school. And I was like, whoa, you know, ordinary English, like, I'm definitely able for higher level. Uh, and it kind of, it was a bit of a shock to me. It was almost like a wake up call. I said, geez, I need to get the to figure out, I need to start committing myself to working harder. So I remember going into sixth year, I kind of had this new uh, lease of life when it came to academics, partly because of that. And I actually sat in that guy's English class front row every time, got awful slaggings. I got papers thrown at me because it was kind of the messer class. It was the, 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 the very lowest higher level class at the time. And uh, got an awful bit of stick for it, but I worked really hard, did all the homework, did all the essays, and I you know, put the work in. And that really helped me in my grades starting to prove, which was great. Now, the other thing was, though, I picked out a friend of mine. We were very close in school, and uh, a guy called Dane, actually, I'm going to give his name here. And we said to each other, uh, in sixth year, let's, let's make it a competition. We're about the same road, uh, same level um, academically as each other. And we said, Let, let's kind of compete for the Leibniz, or let's see who's better. And that was incredibly motivation. We did similar subjects, 
We were both kind of good at the maths and the sciences, uh, although he was way better at English than me. And uh, we, we kind of set ourselves this gauntlet, I'm going to beat you in the leaving cert, and he said the same you know, to me. And that was really, really motivating. Um, and there were two things that really kind of woke me up in sixth year, and I really started putting the work in. One other thing, now, I don't mean to go off on too many tangents here, but was, was uh, leaving cert physics all the through fifth year. I was getting you know C's and D's on my tests, mm-hmm. and my teacher told me again, I think you should aim for a C or D in the leaving cert, don't get your hopes up. But I got an A in junior cert science, and I wasn't too pleased with that. Uh, so I went out, sought help from a different teacher, and uh, this guy like taught physics in a way I'd never seen before, opened my eyes up to like, whoa, I actually can do this. If physics is explained properly, or in a certain way, it's it, it's actually not hard or complicated, and I worked really hard at that. Um, then coming to the end of kind of sixth year, after putting all the work in, I actually did better than I kind of thought I'd do. Um, but it was kind of, what, what kind of gave me the willpower to work hard was were, were those kind of elements looking back, things that I was told I couldn't do something. Um, and I said, no, I know, I think I can do it. And that was quite motivational for me. Uh, and then also the fact that I kind of picked out this pal of mine to kind of compete against. And it was kind of a healthy competition. We actually helped each other. You know, we both did physics, for example, and we used to like quiz each other on all the definitions. And, uh, you know, we, you know, it was kind of a good camaraderie we had, but there was a bit of that competition element to it. And that made it more exciting, yeah. as much as it sounds, rather than just kind of being on your own in the leaving cert, with yeah. no real reasons to solidly put yourself forward. Yeah, you, had a, you, know, you almost had a partner, and you had a, like you would have now, with like somebody in the, in the gym or somebody you had, had a gym partner you had somebody that you were competing against but also you're pulling each other up yeah. uh, am I right in saying that I think we were, when we were talking off air you said there was 114 definitions yeah no no I made that up I think, I think there's actually over 120 well back when I did it it was like 120 uh-huh. something now I could be wrong this is yeah. top of my head it was a long long time ago but I knew every one of those definitions inside out back to front Yes. Uh, because of the games we used to play it's not, we used to stand right on this staircase this is how sad we were but the answer worked and uh, the game was that one person would go to the bottom of the staircase and the other person would go to the top and we'd set a timer. Okay. And for every definition you got right, you got to climb a step. For yeah. every definition you got wrong, you had to go back down a step. Oh, and the okay. idea was that whoever got to the top of the staircase first won. Yeah. One was probably, I don't know, a chocolate bar or a can of Coke or something. Yeah. But it was incredibly motivational. <laughs> so we would literally be up all night learning definitions for this game the next day. And it yeah. worked. You know, yeah, things yeah. like that, which injected a bit of gamification into the whole Eden service. Kind of model, kind of experience, which made it a little bit more interesting. So yeah. that's kind of something I did. No, that's 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 fantastic. So uh, you you, ha- you do actually have these incident incident. Did you know that they were defining things when you were at the time, or is that more just looking back? Yeah, absolutely. No, didn't know it at the time. It's yeah. only by looking back that you, as Steve Jobs has said before, that you can connect the dots. You can go. It's hard to connect the dots looking forward. By like, what I mean is, it's hard to know how significant moments of your life are yeah. at the time. It's only when you look back at those moments in retrospect where you go, "Whoa! If I hadn't done that, it wouldn't have led to this event, or I wouldn't have met that person, or I wouldn't have pushed myself to do that thing." Mm-hmm. You know. So definitely looking back, it did. You know, I can connect the dots and see how significant those elements were to yeah. help me through that difficult year. Yeah, and just. Uh in like your well, got in your sort of spare time, like we, you were saying that you weren't academically pushed, and that helped you to like what you, I assume around the time of and now forgive me if I'm wrong around the time your PlayStation One hit. <laughs> yeah, so as I said, I was really bad at English in school, and yeah. the reason I was bad at English was I never read books. Okay, uh, about the only novel I ever read by the time I got to six year was a Goosebumps, uh, Say Cheese and Die, I believe it was. Great novel. It was on the, cor- the, on the course. At the end. It's on the, it's on the course next year, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, yeah. There's some great c- comparatives to be drawn from that and other very serious novels. Um, cheese. Food. Food. Action. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, like the, uh, so I didn't read books when I was young. And I should have read books. Reading books is so important, but it's not you nowadays. It's very difficult. I can only imagine. Back then, I had a PlayStation One, and I was addicted to this thing. I love, yeah. you know, Metal Gear Solid, uh, Resident Evil, Crash Bandicoot. You know, all these old school games. And I was saying like an ancient old fella. But like, I was addicted to that rather than reading books. And as a result of that, like my use of English was very, very poor. I couldn't write very well, and um, my vocabulary was weak, and uh, my articulation was just off. Like I just wasn't very, you know that way inclined because of what my habits were, yeah. uh, which is definitely something that held me back in English. And I put a lot of work in to overcome that in sixth year to try and get a better result. Because then I was told I couldn't even pass higher level. I ended up actually at a B1, which wow. is I suppose equivalent to H2 and new money. 
mm. this stage. Is uh, just a, this is just me thinking off the top of my head that you were big into computer games, and I could consistently see stuff on YouTube now about kids that are massively into computer games, and and there is actually an element of uh, of problem solving behind that. And you just told me there that you were into sort of like kind of like science, but you were mainly into maths, so you were kind yeah. of a mathy sort of person. Maybe potentially just like subconsciously that that love for that has has drawn this problem solving in you, which then you sort of subconsciously saw on maths and mm. legend in there. Uh, Absolutely, yeah, no, hundred percent. You, you did say to me before that you used to play a game that I was obsessed with called Command and Conquer. Uh, it's a, just for anybody who's never played it before. There was the two armies, isn't it? And obviously, I, I, being a bad boy, I used to select the Brotherhood of Nod. Oh, man, they're the evil yeah, regime. Yeah, 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 that was me. That was me. That was <laughs> uh, but so you, you completed your leaving cert then, and uh, you went on to college. Now, how, how did you decide what path you were going to go down? You, you, the world is your oyster, but like, you know, that's often sometimes there's too many friends, there's too many things to go, to go with. How did you decide you wanted to go? Well, what did you actually do? Let, let everybody know what you actually did and how you got to how you got to that yeah. that decision, that yeah. life defining decision. That's it. Yeah, and some people think that this decision is going to define the rest of their lives. I think that's why the leaving cert has so much kind of anxiety around it. Is because people think if they don't do well, that I won't get that college degree, and I won't like the careers boat will leave the dock without me, mm. and I'll be left with no job and no future. And mm. um, well, in reality, is very different to to that, but. Um, I, I chose engineering as my college degree, which I ultimately ended up doing, got into UCD, civil engineering. Uh, why did I choose that? Well, uh, as I said, I was always more inclined towards the maths and the sciences, and I actually loved Lego growing up. Not only was I playing PlayStation 1, I was playing with Lego quite a bit as well. And when, whenever I go to these guidance counsellors or talk to people generally about what I might do in college, it was always coming back to engineering because of the maths and the, you know, the building element to it. And, um, more civil engineering is what I actually end up doing in the end um, and that's kind of where my kind of my head was at and I was always told that engineering is a good base for other career options you know a lot of engineers become uh, accountants or a lot of engineers become entrepreneurs or a lot of engineers become you know just do something like yoga instructors probably in some case during the recession I'm sure they did and mm -hmm. um, so I ended up doing it uh, applying for uh, eight engineering courses on my CAO and I ultimately actually got the first one which was UCD which was then wrote from my house and I, well, all the lads were gone there kind of thing and that's literally yeah. my thinking at the time which is very very mature as you can imagine yeah. but that's what I ended up doing um, and it's funny is when I went down actually when I was kind of thinking about engineering I was I, I said I go to the open night in UCD to see what it's like yeah. and they sell the dream oh boy do they show you that you're gonna be building skyscrapers you're gonna be building bridges you are gonna be building the future yeah, yeah. and uh, I was like beautiful I'm sold where do I sign kind of thing and I went in in first year and there was nothing but maths all day long and maths is great like but like it's kind of not very exciting and then second year was a bit more maths and the maths got a bit harder and then then third year was just it just even more maths and there just there wasn't enough of this practical learning or big cool skyscrapers or amazing bridges and yeah that's kind of <laughs> the dream kind of turned into a bit of a nightmare in that respect but how, how, how do you feel that like when you went there and it is i know from going there myself as well there is a massive difference from having a having this is what you have to do at this time here are your notes here are your tests and and you're going ahead and, and doing this versus when you get into college uh, the, it, there's like you know there's 200 people in, in your course your lecturer or your, your teacher they don't they don't really mind if you go or not and then you're the decision is forced onto you uh, how, how did you find that that transition from the school and where you said you know you you broke it down you had your friend i'm not sure if you had this friend in college with you you didn't maybe have the the people to like the lecture doesn't like a teacher saying you can't do it might have motivated you mm -hmm. but if the lecture doesn't care if you do it or, or if you don't do it they don't care if you show up or not yeah so how did you find that transition that and uh, very difficult uh, very difficult because and I think a lot of students do because you come from an environment in secondary school where you're told where to be mm -hmm. you know when to be when to be there and you know to have your work done or else there'll be consequences you know if you yeah. don't do your homework you don't study for this test or you don't turn up you're in trouble there's, there's consequences to be paid uh, and when you're going to college the lecturer does not give a fiddlers if you're there or not he stands up or she stands up they give their class for an hour and then they leave. There's no roll call, there's no accountability, there's nothing. You're expected to turn up, you're expected to be pre you know, to be presently engaged and to 
um, actively, you know, taking the content, uh, which is often very loosely put together, um, and then go off in your own time and read up on, you know, extra work outside of that to prepare yourself. And I found that transition very, very difficult. And after cutting off a decent enough leaving cert to get into engineering, I quickly fell down the ranks in the in my grades and in, in, in college. You know, I was scraping to get by uh, in each of the sets of exams. There were Christmas exams and there were summer exams at that point. And uh, I would scrape through them. I'd often have to repeat subjects. I'd have to, uh, you, you kind of passed if you got an E in a subject. And pulled you up. And it pulled you up if your other yeah, yeah. grades were good enough. And I spent my life in, in college, and this is something every student will do unless you're super, super driven. Um, I spent my life working out what exactly do I have to get in these sets of exams to guarantee my 2 1 at the end of the year. Yeah. You know, I spent my life just going, what's the bare minimum I can do to, to get through this yeah. year? And uh, that, that was a challenge. And one of the things I found about college, and it was a function of me not being interested in the subject matter. I went into engineering kind of by accident. Yeah. Ah, sure, I'll try it, you know. But as soon as I got in there, I realized this isn't really what I like doing. This isn't really, you know, floating my boat. This isn't really in an area that I'm really, you know, concerned with. You know, it's a very important career profession, but it wasn't really like my flair. And I quickly found that um, I didn't go to lectures because I found them, the way that the, 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 the content was delivered, I wasn't enjoying it. Yeah. Um, you, you'd think that, I don't mean to go off and around here, but third level, it's just very different to what I was used to. It was kind of like the lecture was there to lecture and then they kind of moved on. There was very little help outside of that. Yeah. And that was something that I struggled with big time. And yeah. it's not a lot of people actually. Yeah, most of college. Was, myself included. It's funny when you say that about the doing the bare minimum to get by. I remember one year when I was in Trinity, I had six subjects for my summer exams, and I decided I was going to focus on four of them. Because mm -hmm. four of them I kind of had pretty well, and I, I was, I was I'm going to repeat the two. Yeah. And in Trinity, they have this policy, but certainly they did in best at the time that if you. I did actually fairly well in, like, okay for the four subjects, but if you fail two subjects below 20%, I didn't know with this, you have to repeat them all. So I just didn't even study for them, wrote them off, and then had to end up repeating all the exams. And that was a massive, massive, massive lesson to always try your best, or at least if you're going to do something yeah, yeah. like that, make sure you know the rules. Okay? At least try something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was that was a tough summer for me. But uh, uh, yeah, it, it's interesting you say that because I know that a lot of people like lecturing. You know, a lot of people become lecturers uh, because they they want to. Their passion is actually in research. Their passion yeah. is writing papers and stuff. One of my friends at the moment is considering. Uh, is considering becoming a well, he's, he's in the middle of doing his PhD and he's considering becoming a lecturer as a lecturing post or something like that. Yeah. But he found that a lot of people that he wanted to teach, he was like in the teaching aspect of stuff and he was loving the tutorials that he's involved in. But the, a lot of people flip it on their head and they're there to have a, a, a separate role. So yeah. And that comes across big time in the environment in third level versus second level. In second level, you know, in a place like this, for example, the teachers here, their primary objective is to get their students, you know, through the year, you know, and achieve the best that they can achieve. That's yeah. their primary objective. That's why they come to work every day. That's what drives them. Where in university setting, and this isn't speaking for every lecturer, but what was apparent to me from my experience was that the lecturers in engineering, their primary objective was not to get us through engineering. Their primary objective, as you said, was to, to write research papers, to you know, improve the, uh, the ranking of the college overall by publishing more content and material, becoming more of a thought leader. That's fine. You know, that's great, and that's what their objective is. But for students need to realise that that their secondary objective, probably even tertiary objective, is to lecture that module on uh, steel beams. Yeah. Uh, and you know, they don't really care if the students are there or not. Yeah. You know, they're they're going to give the test at the end of the year regardless of how much you've studied and. They're probably not going to call you up and say, where were you, man? Have you been putting the work in? There will yeah. be none of that. And that's where the difference is going from um, second level to third level. You don't have the handhold. You don't have that environment of, we're here to help you. It's like, you know, good luck. You know, you, you work as hard as you want. If you don't want to work, that's fine. Um, so I think that's a, quite a big adjustment for students. And it certainly was for me. Yeah. But there, there has to have been, there has to have been st stuff that maybe it's not from the book or stuff that's on, on the actual course map that was there for you or the, uh, that you took out of college, there has to have been some skills or some ideas that you took from your, four, was it four years? Four yes, years? Yeah, four, four years. Four yeah. years on the campus of UCD, whether uh, like it be in the classroom, out of the classroom, or as you said, scraping boy. So could yeah. you tell us a little bit about some skills you learned 
Um, from your time there. Apart from socialising and learning how to drink, um, there was there definitely some um, other skills I learned, and that, no, I'm just kidding with that one, although it's the truth. Yeah. Uh, but but looking back, I'm just taking that like, concept back into the conversation. Um, two things that I definitely took away from college that have stood to me nowadays would be number one was res being resourceful. Okay, and um, in what we're doing now and working for yourself and whatever that might be. And the number one, the number one skills, one of the main skills, let's call it, is resourcefulness. Okay, it's the, it's the ability to do more with less. So when I was in college, the thing that I didn't have very much of was knowledge or experience or time in class or even notes to work off. So I'd figure out how do I make the most of that. And uh, myself and a really, really close friend of mine, a guy called Brian, uh, we got together. We were in engineering at the same time, and we both didn't really like it all that much. And we were in the same predicament that we weren't going to classes because we weren't that interested, but we had to get through it. So we got together and uh, we sought out other students in our year and even the year ahead of us and said, "Look, guys, help us. You know, we'll pay you. Basically, we will pay you uh, in money, in pints, in whatever. Please just help us get through these exams." Um, and we did that. And it was really, really useful. We also sought out PhDs in engineering. We'd knock on their door and go, listen, we've got this test coming up and we don't have a clue what's going on. Can you help us? And, uh, you know, if we were willing to pay them, they were. And we did. And we paid them. We paid them for notes that they'd written. We paid them just to teach us concepts. And we worked really, really hard at it. Um, and it was this idea of just, you know, dare I say, not hacking the system, but it's a case of, you know, figuring out a way to get through something when you're kind of on the back foot a bit or you haven't got many resources. It's being resourceful, doing more with less. And that's a, definitely a key learning from my time in engineering. And um, so that's the first one. The it, other skill, it, just to jump in on that, yeah. with the, what I think is, is really, really intelligent about that is you, you got knowledge and you learned from other people putting in all the hours for you almost. Obviously mm -hmm. you had to go home and study and you had, to, you had to pay them a certain amount of money. But if you think about it, in terms of related relatableness, these people, you know, if they're students, they, they have to break it down for their level as well. They have a similar level of understanding as you, so they have to, to put it across to you. And then, because you're actually physically giving them something, they would have felt that they had to put it in a certain way that you understood it. Yeah. So, as you said, it's, it's not hacking, but it kind of was. Uh, and I, I, that just is massively intelligent. Instead of spending the how many hours reading and doing all this stuff, it was condensed and presented to you in a package and in a way and with the language that you could understand. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And it actually worked though because we got through those exams because we study process around that. And we didn't cram is the main thing. What, what, what's probably coming across here is that we were up the night before just cramming. No, we, we, we basically stopped going to the lectures. We didn't find them interesting. And we studied ourselves in our own time, which worked a lot better for us. I don't never, never, ever beg for cramming the night before. You know, it's 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 it can get you through sometimes, but all in all, it's not really a good strategy. So, like we just found a different way to learn. So that's just a, an important thing to put across there. So this idea of just starting with the end in mind really helped us. You know, um, and then so that's the, the first skill was that that I took away from college. The second one, which is a little bit quicker than the first one to explain, was this idea of presenting. So when I was in school, um, I would avoid any kind of in, uh, event that I have to speak at because, like most people, public speaking was something that was I was terribly afraid of, and it was something I'd avoid like the plague. And I remember in first year I avoided it in college as well. In second year I managed to avoid it, but then it got into third year, and third year was a different story for us. They basically made us do a presentation every single week, and um, through third year to a panel of three engineers uh, and your entire class. And you basically be given a brief the week before, design a bridge to go across this distance, you know, come back to us in a week with your plans. Yeah. And then you'd stand from the class and do that. And I did, I, of course I had no choice but to do it, but I, you know, I did it, the first one was awful, I made a mess of it, uh, I was terribly embarrassed, the, the engineers picked it apart, like you know, it was literally like a joke basically, yeah. but you know, I built on that. And then I did another one and it actually got a little bit better. And then by the time I'd finished, I was actually getting, you know, really good feedback and it improved my confidence massively. And presenting is something that I have to do now on a weekly basis here at the school, what we're doing here, whether it's to the students, to the parents, to the staff, whatever. And that's a skill that has massively helped me in my journey now. So my advice is for anyone um, in doing the leave certain now, like when you get into college and 
you know, there is an opportunity to, pre to present and jump at it, no matter how afraid you are of it, because everyone's afraid is the first thing. Uh, so don't worry about that, you're not alone in that, but like any opportunity there is to present, do it as much as you can, because later in life, you will realize the value of that. It's yeah. unbelievable. If you're willing to present and you're able to coherently put across an argument or a message um, and influence a group of people, they're the skills that the market will pay for. Yeah, they yeah. are the things you will see that, you know, just because you got an H1 in applied maths, that's great, good for you. But unless you can convince a group of people, you know, about a concept, you know, that's really, really significant, that'll make the difference in a business or an organization, you know, having your H1 in maths won't do much for that. Yeah, that I makes think, sense. I think, I think that's interesting. So between that, you, you had the resourcefulness, you actually had the, the the bravery to go and knock on people's doors and the bravery to do something, do it a little bit different away from the status quo of you have to go to these exact lectures, these exact times, but you had a plan. It wasn't that you were winging it, so you were like, we need to find, we need to find some other way of doing this. And uh, I, th I think I think that's 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 crazy. That's really, 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 really good. Is, um, it, would, it, would it be safe to say that from that, you, from have, on the back of that, you decided that then you wanted to be an engineer for the rest of your life, or would it be safe to say that you decided that, was there a point where you wanted, you realized I want to work for myself, or did that, being able to cook, like you know, a, you know, one of the, a, a massive college, being able to get through their course in your manner, in the style that you, you did it, did that maybe give you confidence to go and decide actually I want to work for myself I can do things in my own way or how did it how did you jump from being a potential civil engineer or a civil engineer to to now like what 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 are the steps that push you on that journey sure and um, I love to sit here and say that I got this divine moment of inspiration where I said you know what I'm gonna do this and uh, this is exactly what happened and this is what it felt like but uh, the truth is, it wasn't divine inspiration, it was absolute desperation, which put me on the path that I'm on now. When I was growing up, uh, we, we had a family business, and I was always told, one day you'll work in that family business. And when and the idea of doing, being an engineer came up was, that's a great degree to get, and it's a great platform to go into the family business with. Yeah. You'll learn great skills and that, problem solving, maths, and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. So. And that was kind of my plan, a preordained destiny that I was gonna you know, go for. And I was kind of fine with that. You know, I was 17, 18. Sounded good to me, grand. Like, yeah. Less thinking I need to do about my future, the better. Uh, now, when I was in college, in coming into fourth year, it was the, the recession hit. You know, I think six years now, we're probably around seven years old when the recession hit, so they probably can't yeah. remember, it's a distant memory. Um, but the recession hit, and in that recession, our family business went under which was a devastating event at the time, uh, which was caused a lot of pain and hurt. And suddenly my kind of plan went out the window. So I figured out I didn't want to be an engineer pretty quick because I didn't really like the content I was learning. I was just forcing myself through it to get to the degree, which isn't really a good reason, but it's what happened. But I was always thinking, I should work in the business. It'd be great. And then that, once that was taken away from me, everything changed. And what was so in, it was so coincidental, was that totally parallel to that experience was that uh, my really close friend, a uh, guy called Brian, uh, who I did engineering with, who we got through the degree together, but he had the exact same thing happen to him. He uh, had a family business that went under in the recession also, at the exact same time. And we then just said, you know what, let's start something new. You know, we get out of this degree, if we ever do, let's out something else. And we racked our brains to all the forth, trying to figure out what are we gonna do when we get out of here. Yeah. And we thought of all sorts of ideas, harebrained stuff. Um, and what eventually you know, we agreed on was that um, in, in all the way through college, Brian was giving one-on-one -on -one maths grinds in, uh, you know, on his motorbike every night. He was doing about 10, 15 of these a week, making a fortune. He was doing really, really well. And he built up a really good name in his area for doing them. And I said to him one day, you know, have you ever thought about doing you know, your own kind of school or a classroom environment? Why don't you do them one at a time, do them in a room? And he said, I thought about it, but never got around to it. And I said, well, why don't we try that? Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do that when we get out of here, if we ever do. And uh, we agreed, that was the plan. And when we finished up uh, our last set of exams in May of 2010, uh, we said, let's open it up for September. Do open up a math school, or we'll do maths classes in the local parish centre. Uh, and we'll call it the Dublin School of Maths. But well, you can't do that, Chris. Uh, you're, you're too young, and you don't know anything about education. What, 
what, what, what happened? How can you set up a randomly set up a school? Um, that, so, that was the thing. Sorry, sorry, I'm cutting cut you across there. Across you there. Uh, I, I think that the the thing to do with Brian and think the resourcefulness it actually fascinates me. And you're saying there. I remember one time speaking to to Brian about his motorbike, and he said it actually helps me beat all the traffic to get into UCD. I have to get up. I remember that absolutely years ago that it, you guys are thinking a certain way to do something different, and then to think of oh we're engineers now we're coming straight out engineering let's set up a a, a maths school. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. So I like, cut across because I just got excited. And you cut across, and that's exactly what happened to people when I told them the idea, and when yeah. Brian told them the idea. Oh, we're going to set up a math school. Like, what are you talking about? You're an engineer. You know, you don't know anything about education. What are you doing? Yeah. You know, he's stupid or something. Literally, that's what we heard. Every time we told anybody, even like the, those closest to us were like worried about us. Yeah. What are they doing? You know, they should be off in Dubai or Saudi Arabia working on a building site somewhere because that's the only place you get work at the time. And that didn't sound very appealing to us. So, uh, regardless of that, you know, um, kind of opinion been out there, uh, we, we, we kind of drove on with it. Yeah. And uh, we spent that summer after we finished college kind of preparing for the year ahead of the Dublin School of Maths. And um, we, you know, it was really, really simple. You know, we said we need a venue. Okay, so we went down to the local parish centre at Cabin Tea and they had a lovely room and we rented that. We said we'll take it from these nights. That's fine. Then we designed up a flyer on our home printers, our home computers, and words like you want to see in this thing, it would look like really like Times New Roman, black and white, yeah. like maths classes. It was just really basic. Uh, but uh, we printed them off and we sucked them up in post offices and supermarkets and from everywhere from kind of Balls Bridge to Bray. Yeah. And but, shout out to Bray. Bray, Bray, yeah, yeah. Bray that is living in Bray. Love Bray, but that's great. Um, and the funny thing was, uh, Brian also, sorry, had a bit of a reputation, a good reputation in the area, which helped kind of ignite the interest in, in, in the math school. Mm -hmm. And we opened our doors uh, that September to, I think it was 26 kids turned up to the various classes we had that week. And then, um, you know, as the weeks went on, more and more students started to sign up. And Brian was the, the only teacher at the time. And what became apparent very quickly was that even Brian didn't realise this, that he was unbelievably good at teaching maths. Just, you know, there's something special about the way that he explained it, the way that he put it across in his notes. And it was quite, he was very enthusiastic about it. And kids and students engaged with it. And word of mouth grew really quickly. You know, we finished up that year with, let's say, 100 students. And at that point then, um, we were actually we're working part, we worked in jobs during the day and we worked in the evenings on this math school in the first year. I worked on a building site, Brian worked in a green grocery. And uh, at the end, start of our second year, we packed in the jobs. Brian's brother actually joined, a guy called Tom, joined the school. And the three of us embarked then on growing that uh, from not just a math school, but also offering other subjects. And uh, because a lot of people said to us, why are you just doing maths? Would you not do Irish, English, French, biology, Spanish, you know, all these other subjects that are out there. And we were really kind of, we thought carefully about it and considered the fact that, okay, well, why is the maths working so well? And the reason was, is because the maths was so well taught. The teacher was so, so good. And if we're going to replicate this across other subjects, we have to make sure the quality remains consistent. And we cannot put on a class with a teacher who isn't up to the mark because in this industry, it's all about word of mouth. And if you have a bad experience, you'll tell nine people. If you have a good experience, you might tell three people. So we couldn't afford to have bad experiences. So we put all of our time and energy um, as we grew from that sort of subject in finding the right teachers to help grow the school. And when we didn't look at, the well, first thing we did was we asked the students in our maths classes, Do you, are there any teachers in your school that are really good? And what subjects do they teach? And they tell you. And then we uh, we get all their names and we go out and meet them. And rather than hire them based on their CV or you know their the fact they'd written a textbook or or advice for the curriculum or based on an interview, we say to them we teach a class for us because it's the only way to, the only way to know if a teacher's a good teacher is to watch them teach. That's just the mantra that we have here. It's like picking a player for a football team. Like you're not going to ask them for their CV and give them a job interview. You're going to watch them play a match. So they know if they're a good player. Mm -hmm. And by sticking to that kind of um, mantra, it worked. Like. We didn't get it right every time. We hired people we thought would be good and they weren't, or we hired people we weren't sure of, and they turned out to be amazing. Um, and 
uh, that, that we really restuck to that by, by, by making it the core focus of the school was the quality of the teaching. Because if the teachers are good and they get the students the results, the students will talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we really, really focused on. What, what, I can, what I can tell from your story there is there's a lot of people that I know, and you hear it any time you chat to your friends over a coffee or, or any time, anywhere, I'm sure every single person is the same thing. A lot of people want to work for themselves. They want to live this dream and they have these ideas of working for themselves for various reasons. And what, what I've seen with, with yours is with, with why yours came true versus the 100 people who they didn't actually go for it and they're still probably talking about it to this day, is you had a, a partner in Brian. You had somebody that you were accountable with. Mm -hmm. Somebody who you said you were going to do something, and he said you are going to do something. So you nearly maybe were afraid to say to question, oh, can we do this? And the, the thing that I, I found massively impressive is you finish your degree to a lot of people, just like the leave here. That's it. It's done. It's done. We're over with life. Like, that's fine. We've completed it. And you complete your degree. You had in motion already, and it probably worked out well with the way this, with the way the school uh, timing is. That in that September you were you were going to start a school, so there was no time for you to question yourself. There was no time to say, "Are we allowed to do this? Can we do this?" It was, "Let's go, let let's go." Yeah. So that that was for that one. But what what then? When you came to a crossroads where you were a builder and he had and he had his job where it came to a sense, right, there was always the, okay, we could fall back, we could fall back, but you want to cut off and you want to split into let's let, let's go with this 100%, let's, as Tommy Robinson says, burn the boats. Uh, what do you reckon actually allowed you guys to, instead of holding back and saying, we'll see maybe next year, to actually go, to go ahead with it? Hmm. Um, you said something really uh, interesting there, it's this term of burning the boats. And what that means is, you know, if you want, if you're in a load of ships and you want to take over an island, the best way to take over the island is actually to burn your boats, land on the island, and set all the boats on fire, because um, you, you you rule out the option just to to, pay, to kind of chicken out. So it's kind of, um, if you are put in a position where you're kind of die or succeed, humans tend to succeed. Like that's kind of that extreme example of it. And um, but when the the safety net that I had, which was the family. Uh, business that I was told I'd go into one day when that was taken away from me that was my always my kind of plan B once that was taken away from me rather than being a terrible thing it actually was an amazing thing because it gave me the lack of options to do anything else and we're left with one option you generally that's what you're going to do and that's what you're going to you're going to pull your energy into and that's that that's what happened uh, you know I, I don't believe there's a reason to have a plan B there's a distraction plan A um, and our plan A was to build something new and that was it and you know, I think that knowledge is certainly power, uh, but knowledge is only kind of potential power. Unless you backed up with execution, it's useless. And what me and the, the lads did was, we had no choice but to execute and to do stuff, because there was nothing else to do. It's like, it was like that or nothing. Um, and we really, really stuck to that uh, kind of idea of just, just roll up the sleeves, get in the trenches, keep learning. Yes, we know nothing about education. Yes, people think we're idiots for trying to do something that's totally alien to what you'd expect a young person with an engineering degree to be doing. Yeah. But we kind of had to block that out and just focus on, you know, doing things, taking action, making mistakes, adjusting our course. And, you know, what happens over time is you build on all that failure and suddenly, you know, you break through the, the clouds and you get that traction and, and things start to come together. You'd be surprised at, you know, how that happens. Yeah, so I'm sure, I'm sure there was a, uh, a hell of a, of a lot of, of lessons, a hell of a lot of lessons in that, and I'm also sure that, uh, like you know, the early days are kind of a little bit different. But and you kind of touched on it there. What were the things that that kept you going? Like that you had it for your leaving cert, you had the the friend and you had the teacher. So it was a basic the, the the whole point of the family business, and this is the only option. Those are the two things that kept you going in day and day, and wanting to expand, wanting to. And um, well, that's a really good question, and one that's quite hard to coherently articulate. But what I would say is, in the early days, what kept us going was the fact that we had to do something because there was nothing else to do in our in our minds. Yeah. And as I said, when when the family businesses went under in the recession, that caused a lot of pain and a lot of you know, but both mental and physical. And I wanted to do whatever I could to stop that and to alleviate that and to you know, relieve that. And that was in the early days, I was just kind of in a frenzy trying to do whatever I could to stop that. And that was very motivational. But what's funny is as I moved through 
you know, my journey, I figured out that, hang on a sec, I actually really like doing this. And it was only by being thrown into a crazy arena that I'd never seen before or experienced anything of in my lifetime that I actually figured out she's actually loved this. This is really interesting, you know. It's getting a bit of feedback from a parent or a student saying how X, Y, and Z changed their life, you know, or how uh, they were at this level and now they're at that level, and that's really helped them, you know, for other in other areas or arenas in their life. And I figured out, geez, I really like what we're doing here. This is interesting, and um, kind of looking back, um, and if I was to give advice for, to somebody who was trying to figure out what they like doing, I would say, uh, number one is, you won't be able to just sit in a chair and figure out, yes, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. It's only by getting out there and taking action and experiencing new things and talking to people and interacting and, you know, um, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone that you'll actually, that exposure will help kind of demystify what it is you love. Yeah. Okay, does that kind of make sense? It's basically like, just get out there and do stuff and you'll figure out pretty quick what you don't, what you don't like and what you do like eventually. So, you know, looking you know, looking back again, I'd say there's kind of three intersecting circles that helps, you know, me figure out what is it that I should be doing. Yeah. And the the three intersecting circles, looking like a Venn diagram, you're yeah. a mass teacher, you know, with this. And um, in one of the circles I'd write the word passion. In the other circle I'd write the word words, what are you really good at? Or maybe it's something you're not really good at, but what could you be really good at? Right, so write that in the next circle. And in the final circle, I write in what's something there's a market for. Okay, that's very important. Because if you're really passionate uh, about tiddlywinks and you're really good at it and you're your best in the world at tiddlywinks, it might not be the best career option, you know, in some case. Maybe it is, maybe tiddlywinks has really come on in the last few years, I'm not sure. Yeah. But um, I would say, you know, if you can find something that you're, you love doing, something that you're really good at and something there's a market for, you've got your niche yeah. right there. That's what you should focus on. For example, if somebody is really good at numbers, right, they're super at numbers um, and they're amazing with people, right, yeah. and they go off and become uh, an actuary, it's an amazing uh, profession, they're amazingly well paid and revered and stuff, but they're stuck in a room doing Excel all day at the laptop and they're not interacting with people, yeah. they're quickly going to become unhappy with that because they're not getting that interaction. Whereas maybe that person said, you know, I love people, I love numbers, I want to be CEO of a company one day. You're going to, you're going to get a much better experience of life and a much more drive. It's, you know, realizing those kind of values of yours, if that kind of makes sense. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of as best as I can explain it. So do you think that, like, so for example, when, I, when I'm, uh, I remember I used to think from my background, I was, I had a fantastic upbringing, but I was spoon-fed a lot. And then when I started to try, I, it, the, my eyes were open to more, there's more in the shop shelf of life, and the, other, seeing other people around me getting things that they want and actually going after stuff, that realized, that made me realize I could work hard and, and go, go get it. But then I remember one thought, and think, think of how negative this thought is that came into my head. It's like, uh, everyone that's doing good stuff has had something bad happen to them. Oh, I haven't had anything bad happen to me. Yeah. Uh, so I can't do anything good. Like, You're so like, unlucky. Yeah, I'm so unlucky that nothing could, like terrible has happened in my life. Um, and, and I kind of think that a lot of people, especially now that, you know, there's nearly three layers to people's education in their life before they go out, get out and have to make mistakes. And then sometimes they end up being like 28 before they start to look for what they actually like. So do, what, what would you say, like, so, say to a person like me who, let's just say you went in, you did secondary school and you went to college because everyone goes to college and now everyone seems to be doing masters in whatever and then doing an interview, then doing a job for a couple of years and then realizing, wait a second, like a lot of, a lot of people that are my age, you know, like uh, still in their 20s, you know, so relatively young, but you know, they, they, they still don't really know what they do. So you, you would say to them what, to take a step back from it all, not just to follow a routine, not to go into it. They should have, they should sit down with these three circles and think about themselves, think about them versus being influenced. So the three three circles again were the, the niche, the, sorry, the, the market, your passion, and what you can be best at. And what you can be best at. And finding somewhere for those skills, and that might, like I think it's interesting, that might not automatically jump off the, the page as you, because you know, when people think about, what are you gonna be when you're older? Doctor, lawyer, the, the the, the, you know, so there's all these, but there's thousands, especially as you you always say with the internet now, it's a, all bets are off. There's you can find somewhere to 
to to fit there to fit that and be and with being happy then you could be more actually successful on it yeah. yourself and um, so sorry I was just making trying to make sense of, of all of that for yeah. for me so why you go home and do it no but obviously Absolutely. obviously I, I I ended up stumbling across it and very often a very well pretty much all the time you don't stumble across success you have to go actively look for stuff that you like yeah uh, so I was actually lucky uh, and I'm sure you would consider yourself very lucky with that as well. But but if there was another area in my life like that from now on, sitting back and actually giving it some time would be extremely beneficial. Rather than like you did with the school, go out and take action rather than waiting for the thing to come to you. Mm. Um, huge. Okay. So what what, I, what I'd like you to to tell us a little bit more about, and I think this will be massively interesting, is then how. Like how do, how do you set? How does Chris Lauder set goals for himself? How does he set a target now? Because you know, we hopefully we'll be talking back in ten years, connecting the dots backwards again. But you said it's very easy to connect the dots backwards. How do you set something going forward? How would yeah. you think about your targets now for the future? Um, I think a mistake I've made in the past is that I haven't been specific enough about targets. Um, and what's even more important than that, though, is what's underneath the target. You know, really thinking with clarity as to why am I even setting that target? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of mistakes people make. Uh, I've certainly made. and that thing I was talking about earlier about the why and knowing why it is you're doing what you're doing and trying to be as clear as that as you possibly can that's really really important yeah. um, and then further to that then once you kind of know why you want to do what you want to do try and visualize yourself doing that as much as you can and uh, really see what that's going to be like in the future so start with your why then wrap your kind of vision around that and then then start setting your targets yeah you know okay. rather than uh, saying I want to go to the gym and get fit. You know what does that even mean? Yeah. You know I would say, you know, if, if someone might have an experience where when they were younger they had really bad asthma and they were told you'd never be a fit person and you could never you know do crazy things you know in the fitness world. Well, maybe that person you know it, it could do that. You know, maybe they, their their drive was that I want to overcome that and prove that people who've been had setbacks in life can overcome these things. And I want to share that message to the world and help people. That's that's their why. So they go out and they start pushing themselves, you know, uh, to run, you know, five k, ten k marathons, whatever it is, and become like a beacon of, you know, hope for people yeah. you know, who who've been given a rough deal. Yeah. Okay. And uh, with that person's vision in mind, they can then set very good targets. Yeah. You know, because they're very clear about why they want to do what they're doing, how they're going to do it. They can see themselves doing, then they can set good targets. Yeah. Whereas if someone just says, well, "I want to go to the gym and get fit," but they have no reasoning behind it, yeah, it's just it's the inside of that is just rotten to the core, or it's non-existent. It's like a vacuum. Yeah, that, that goal isn't going to be stuck to. So that's where I'd say for people to try and start. Yeah, if that makes sense. And um, but then with the targets themselves, and um, what what's really really important is that you know you got to make them smart. You got to make them specific. You got to make them measurable. You got to make them achievable. You got to make them realistic. And you got to make them timely. Yeah. Yeah. that's all the generic stuff. That's out there. Yeah, it's true. All of it. You got to be really specific about what you want to do. You got to be able to measure it. You got to be able to, and so on. Throughout all those different words that I that I, that I just said. Um, but I think what's really really important is to uh, is your brain is like a homing missile, right? Whatever it kind of sets its mind to, it kind of does. You know that old cliche: you can do whatever you set your mind to. There's actually a bit of truth in that. Um, and if you've got a really clear target, what that actually does is um, it helps you notice things in the world around you that will help you move towards. So what do I mean by that? Well, when we are walking through our environments, we're hit with so many different stimuli. You know, we're hearing things, seeing things, smelling things, uh, and we're getting hundreds or millions of these things every second. But our brain is filtering all that for us and it's only showing us the stuff that is important. Otherwise, you go crazy. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of your unconscious brain talking to your conscious brain, if that makes sense. It's your unconscious brain going, yeah, yeah, just notice your man called out your name there, but ignore all the traffic behind you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and it's this, by having really clear targets, that filtering system changes. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and if you have, for example, if you were to walk into a supermarket as a mother, you might notice different products on the shelves than if you were walking in State Lewis. Yeah. You know, well, maybe in some cases they'd be overlapped, I don't yeah. know. But, yeah. um, but you mean like the mother, okay, the mother's goal is that she's very focused in her life on her, her child, so she's seeing like baby food and things that could help baby nappies and all that stuff, whereas yeah. David Lewis goes in and he sees on the shelf, uh, I don't know, I, what, 
what's the processed sugar you know that sort of stuff but I, I would see like you know the, the healthy food or I'd see the, the like I, for example I go in and I, I really really like Diet Coke and I go, yeah. I go into a petrol station first thing I catch my eyes Diet Coke yeah. I, I know where it is yeah. or you know I suppose maybe I was I it was thinking uh, this kind of sounds a bit weird, but I know that there's a slight slope from the N11 up to the school, and if I had was stuck for an exercise one day, I could do hill sprints up there. Yeah. Or there's a wall this size that I could do box jumps onto. Yeah. Or there's actually a tree around the corner that you can do chin ups on. You know that that's what I've noticed. Whereas if everyone else is a wall, they probably didn't notice the angle, and it's just that's what I'm focused on. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And kind of further to that, it's once you've got your targets kind of established, you've got your good reasons why to. Now you can have them for the first place. It's important to like just make sure those targets aren't you're not overextending them. You're not reach trying to reach too far. Yeah. Because if you set something that's out of reach totally, you want something that's just sorry, just about out of reach but not out of sight. Yes. Okay. So you don't want to target like if you're you know trying to run a five k. You know you shouldn't say well run a five k. Let's just climb Mount Everest. Yeah. What yeah. happens is that just it's so intimidating. It's such a super crazy goal that. You know, I probably won't take any action at all yeah. because it's so unattainable. It's, yeah, it's a great so, failure. Yeah, that. exactly. So when setting targets, make sure it's out of reach but not out of sight. So it requires a bit of a stretch to get it. Yeah. You know, that's very, very important. Another thing with setting targets then is that you got to make sure, and this is something looking back helped me, was be accountable to somebody else or have somebody in the journey with you. Yeah. Uh, that you're both set the targets. You know, you're both, you're both accountable to each other and you're both trying to get it because that makes it so much easier because but believe it or not, people will do more for other people often than they'll do for themselves. Yeah. As in, they'll do something they really want to do because it will let down someone. Yeah. You know, if they don't do it. Like for example, if you if you want to go to the gym, a great thing to do is get a gym partner and say, "I'll meet you there at seven a.m. tomorrow morning." Yeah. And if you know, if you don't go, you're letting them down. Yeah. And that's very motivating in itself for setting a target. So I'd say accountability. I'd say out of reach, but not out of sight with the targets. And then definitely have your targets rooted with some kind of justification as to like why it's important to you. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Just, to, I, I, I find that the way you, you said it, the filtering system of all the stuff that comes in, like it like shapes your mind and stuff coming in. It reminds me, I find that fascinating and it reminds me of a couple of years ago, you mentioned it a lot on the last podcast, you mentioned Tony Robbins, and we just talked about his burning the boats. And you recommended that I go to one of his events and straight away I checked it up and it was and it a lot of money and I was like, I can't go. And then I realized, okay, well, why do I want to go? And I had a bit of a why behind it. So I went and I traveled across to London for this event. Uh, and being honest, I was nervous. So I didn't really like traveling by myself which, at the time, which since then, obviously I've traveled throughout the world and lucky enough to have done that. But he, he had this, this one idea where what he does is he gets you to look around the room that it's in and you have to look for every single thing that's red so he he talks about you noticing things to do with your goal so if he's saying for example every single thing to do with it's red so if i'm just looking around the room now that like that's red that's red you're starting to see things that are purple you're you're calling them red they're yeah. not even red or pink and red and he's like okay cool i'm gonna get you to recite that but then he, he flips the switch and he says okay this exact room, tell me everything you saw that was blue and suddenly you can't see any of it. Yeah. But because you were constantly focusing on red, you're seeing everything there, but you've just deleted it. You just ignore it literally. Yeah. yeah. So, and it, then it, even though it's there, so by being specific, by having that why behind it, you will start to filter out ideas of how you could get something done. Yeah. Um, powerful, very, very, very good. I think, um, like, then could you tell us then a little bit, just obviously a little bit of, 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 for, for Chris, for Lauder, what's what's in your what's what do you have in your future? What's kind of going on there? Um, well, the journey to this point has been we're nine years in it now. Next year's our tenth anniversary. It's hard to believe a decade out yeah. now, and it's just been the most amazing journey, like filled with ups and downs, and uh, like we're only just getting started. Like we've really kind of found our groove now, mm -hmm. and we, uh, we we just see that the opportunity out there is so massive to to bring the academy's brand to to uh, another level of, uh, you know, offering, if that makes sense. And our goal here is to, at the moment, is it, it's it's the, the grind schools, you know, that, that's going great, that we've been doing that for almost 10 years now, and that's that's really, really going fantastically well. I think we're the largest now in, in the country, which is which is always nice. Um, but kind of more important than that, also with the day school, our goal with the day school is not just make a good school, but make a great school. You know, uh, a school where, you, 
You know, no matter what class you go into, you're taught by a driven, motivated, passionate teacher. You know, no matter who it is uh, that's you know is guiding you through whatever subjects you're taking, they're top class and they're driven and they're for you. They're there for you to make sure you get through that. So it's just to slowly over time uh, work on that, make sure we get it absolutely right. And this year, in our first year, has been amazing. We just learned so much, and the students have been incredible to work with. And our goal is here not to make this a super huge school by any means, but keep the numbers. Uh, contained you know maybe a couple of hundred in the school and leave it at that and why leave it at that because we want to make sure that we have the right culture and the right environment here uh, we don't want a situation where there's thousands of students in the school and nobody knows each other we want an environment where it's like a family that everyone's in it together and everybody knows each other that students know teachers by first name teachers know students and you know there's that, that interaction in class where there's that rapport developed between student and teacher and that's where we're really putting our energy into um, you know, we don't want to have classes of 100 plus students, we want to have classes of 20, you know, and we want to have like, those classes be like workshops, that they're active, they're not passive, where there's just a lecturer at the top of the room lecturing, and you take down notes, no, but it's, it's active learning where students are engaged all the time, and they're working at, on different problems maybe in the same class, but they're pushing each other in different directions, you know, in terms of, you know, their, what, what, what their limits are, but ultimately we're trying to create just the, the most amazing second level school to the country's ever seen so that's sorry that's why i get really excited about this but that's generally what we're that, that that's that's what the goal is and that's what our plan is and um, and you know in time we could look at expanding geographically you know perhaps the north dublin with the day school we actually have grinds starting there in september which we're really super excited about there'll be three nights of grinds out in north dublin which we're very very excited for uh, register now on our website for a free course. Link in the description. <laughs> uh, absolutely, not all, unbelievable. I think that something that me being involved in this school uh, over the last uh, five years has massively affected me as a person being in this being in this environment. And I can see single handedly, like if, not even let's just the students. Obviously, the most important. We'll talk about that in a sec. But every per, every member of staff here has grown from being part of this environment, part of this this seed that yourself and the, the man we talked about, Brian, and then his brother Tom planted those years ago to, for personal growth. And I, I definitely said this to you uh, before, and I really, really believe it, that in my years of teaching, this, well, first of all, this has been the fastest year by a mile, but it's been the most enjoyable. And the, the reason for that is, I, every single day I go to school and I, I'm with people who want to get better at teaching, who want to get better at their job, want to get better interacting with, with students who have personal like things outside the classroom, which might not always be like gym, but they have personal goals and stuff. And that really is, um, man, I can't stress how much that that's motivated me to become better and do more and literally actually do more. Yeah. For, for a lot of the year, I was actually writing do more on my arm. And I know that's a bit weird. I copied it off, off actually Casey Neistat, but it's, uh, it was huge. And then I was getting motivation and I was getting fuel it, from students, seeing students that you know at the start of the year were maybe not as confident, or maybe they weren't as passionate, they weren't a active in their own education. To see them coming in to organising their own study groups, teaching somebody else like you guys, it took desperation in college to do. Uh, help to do having other methods of study, um, and, and and just to see how far they've come in their confidence. And obviously, the classroom is massively important, but seeing that breed into outside things people actively asking can they can they do can they do talks can they can we do the personal development club again and uh, ask, asking can they put clubs on at different times and suit their timetable it was just it's it's mesmerizing to see how being in an environment with these sort of people how not only it just helps what the one student it's brought ev it, the rising tide has brought everybody up yeah and it's uh Oh, it's been an absolutely fantastic year. So yeah. I say, from your point of view, being the the overseer, to see that you would see that that in in your staff, and then and then to, to see it, it coming to somewhere new, so coming to the, the north side of Dublin, it's fantastic. And then you're saying potentially geographically expanding that successful idea. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, big time. You know, I think something you're touching on there is kind of the culture here at the academy. In that, it's one of. You know, we're all in this together. We're all here to do better. We're all here to push each other and support each other. And you know, they say you're the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. 
um, or you're the product of your environment, and it's so, so true. And that's the thing we're really working on here at the Academy is the environment. You know, first of all, getting the right students in, you know, the, the ones who want to be here. We're not interested in taking students who are forced to come here who think it's a magic pill that's going to solve all their problems and they don't have to work hard. No, we want the students who are here to work hard, to, you know, support other students. You know, we want just that kind of camaraderie. That's what we've been working with. And, you know, one of the things I've taken most joy in this year was with actually the personal development club that we worked on uh, this year with the students, which is lovely because I'm actually not a teacher never taught a day in my life, but we've taken on this personal development club and seeing students do the non-academic things, the life skills, you know, the things we were working on them with, with them with like public speaking and overcoming fears and setting goals and, uh, you know, how to communicate more effectively and watching students go through those processes has just been amazing to see, you know, and there's huge, huge value in that and that's something that, uh, you asked me about the future. That's something I want to turn the dials up on next year and the, the, the years following that. I think that's something we can add huge value yeah. to, uh, to, to, to the students. I think that it's something that we've mentioned with the, obviously academics is important. It gets you the platform to go where you want to go. And uh, but some uh, being a maths teacher, consistently students call up, what do you need, let's just say, Pythagoras for? What do you, when's the last time you used Pythagoras outside the school? Yeah. And what I really would like students to know is that the, that the Leaving Cert is a challenge and it's subjects, it, it is a life challenge and it is something that you, te you take the, those, the ability to do something you don't want to do, to organise it, to do your best at stuff you don't want to do, that's the skill in itself. Yeah. Whether writing the English essay, it's the, about the organisation yeah. in, in that itself. And, and discipline. Uh, and, yeah, and the fact that we have this environment that we can actually not only try to emphasise that in the classroom but have something outside it too. Uh, is massive and I think that's what's going to stand to the, the kids that come to this school, the students that come to this school over the next decade as much as the education will, will, will do yeah. as well uh, and I know it will stand to me but li listen Chris just w one more thing I think that uh, hearing about your journey from uh, oh, 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 yeah, PlayStation playing, Goosebumps reading, Lego building uh, to to then the thing the resort the resourceful you to to now if you could go back and talk to the goosebumps reading man which might have been just yesterday I don't know I know you're reading books a lot now but if you could whisper a couple of things in his ear and something that maybe you wish that you would take you started earlier maybe a habit you started earlier something you realised a little bit earlier in your life maybe at around the 16, 17, 18 year old mark what 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 would you, what would you say what um, things would you say yeah you? yeah it's, Probably a couple of things. The first really simply would be get up earlier. Uh, I found that when, when I was a, a student, particularly in college, I used to sleep in until one, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon kind of thing. And you know, it's just such a waste. You know, what I've learned now in the last kind of like seven, eight years, I've just been going to the gyms in, in, in the morning and it has changed my life. You know, I've learned that an hour in the mornings or two in the evening, to quote the old farmer saying. Um, in that an hour in the morning you can get so much more done than you can an hour in the evening. You have so much more energy, so much more willpower, willpower is a resource, you know, and you have so much throughout the day. And uh, with that in mind, if you get up early, you do the thing you're least looking forward to in the day first, toughest task first, it's gonna help you accomplish a lot more throughout the day. It's gonna make the day actual actually feel like it was worthwhile if you do something tough. So I'd say getting up early is something I would force myself to do. Uh, to exercise because uh, things like exercise are like keystone habits that lead to other good habits mm -hmm. so a keystone that holds up other stones yeah. being that you know if you're exercising you're more likely to probably look after what you're eating because you want to be fit and healthy you link the two mm -hmm. you're more likely to have more discipline when it comes to work yeah. you know if you're disciplined in the gym going to the gym you're more likely to be disciplined with your work uh, and if you're um, into the gym and you've got energy and vitality you'll have energy for work yeah. You know, you'll have more endurance for that. So that's one of the key habits, get up early. It's one of the things I'd say, telling a student to get up early is a joke. I remember, I would have laughed my head off if someone told me to get up at 6 a.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think you're some kind of alien. Yeah. Uh, but that's one thing I'd say, is you couldn't come into college, and maybe coming out of college, get up early when you get into the workplace, number yeah. one. And number two is definitely read, okay? As I said, and you make a, a good joke about me only reading Goosebump books. I only started picking up books when I got into college. And what I learned from books was unbelievable. Uh, now, you know, knowledge is power, you know, well, or knowledge is potential power, and it's, unless you actually take action, it's useless. But like, I learned so much from books that helped me then take action. 
you know, I read books from about people's bio people's biographies, people who've done things that I want to do. Maybe someone who's had a successful organization, business, whatever it is, I read their book and go, why do they do it? And between the pages of those books is the roadmap, the blueprint to go and do it. And uh, so I really have immersed myself in reading as much as I can. You know, it's something I have to force myself to do. I was very slow at reading, I still am that fast, but like just trying to dedicate time to do it. I've learned a lot from doing that. Like, have anyone to do that. Um, but more kind of kind of philosophical, uh, um, you know, more kind of off the topic of reading or getting your up early would be don't compare yourself to other people. Uh, this is a really tough thing to do. When I started out uh, when I was younger, I would constantly look what other people are doing and compare myself to them and I wouldn't be doing as well as them, so therefore I'm, I'm terrible. Yeah. And I feel bad about myself. You know, I, I just happened to be in an environment where I knew a lot of other people who had their own work for themselves or had their own companies, wherever that was, and they're all way ahead of me and I was I felt bad about it. Yeah. You know, I'm not as good as them. And I beat myself up about it, which would be stupid. Like it's like comparing your chapter one to somebody else's chapter twenty one. Yeah. You're not comparing like with like. Yeah. And uh, that's the advice I'd have for, for someone is that or for myself back then, it's just focus on you and compare yourself to who you were a year ago. Am I further along? Am I progressing? You know, compare yourself to the targets you set. Yeah. How close am I to the targets? What do I do wrong? What what can I do better? Yeah. So don't compare yourself to someone else because they have their own thing going on. They've had more experience than you maybe. Yeah. Or maybe a leg up that you didn't have. So don't worry about them, worry about you. Yeah. Yeah, just so, just to jump in on that, I think it's massively important in today's day and age, with much of the social media stuff, much of the projections that people are giving, that they really understand that because you know, potentially somebody could have been working on something for 10 years and you're saying, oh, well, I can't run a marathon because I can barely do this, or I can't get, like, you know, somebody could have been studying maths diligently for the last three years, and I think that's massively important. So you can that's get ideas from people like that, yeah. and from reading, I yeah. got loads from reading people's autobiographies. Yeah. But I don't... Think that's a very important point, that just to touch on something you said there, was that people get rewarded in public for what they practiced for years in private. And you always hear the overnight success this, the overnight success that. But like what you, it's like the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. It's what's underneath the water that counts and yeah. where most of the work is done. And sometimes you compare yourself to someone who's on Instagram, who's done X, Y, and Z, and they're in great shape or whatever, but like they put the hours in that you haven't put in and they're maybe the things that aren't so obvious. Yeah. You know, that's what you see on the surface, but underneath it all tells a very different story. Yeah. Um, and that can be very demotivating. You know, you just look at a result that's like someone else has gotten without knowing or understanding the background of that result. Yeah, very often it seems cool to like filter down the hard work that they've done. So yeah. they wouldn't they wouldn't put it underneath. Say if, when I'm looking at say fitness models, I know say there was a friend of mine and he would put up a photo and he'd say, Oh, doing a bit and he's in one of the greatest shapes I've ever seen in my entire life and I know his whole life revolves around that yeah. and he's wrecked throughout the whole day because was at, but then he puts it up and some young child sees that and they think Oh, why am I exactly like that right now? But he's been, first of all, doing it for 10 years, and yeah. second of all, his life revolves around that. Yeah. And if your life revolves around something like that, you could put up a similar post or, or something different. Yeah. I, think, I think that's really important to say. Um, yeah. Well, the last thing I'll say, right, and this, the last thing, this is such like hyperbole, but you know, it took me, I'm 31 now, it took me a long time to realize this, but like, try not to care what other people think of you. Uh, when people laugh at us when you're starting out with the Dublin School of Maths, like that hurt yeah. because uh, they thought we were idiots. And uh, realizing now was looking back that like none of them, none of those people who said those things really cared anything. They didn't care if we did it or not. They just wanted to say something just for the sake of saying it. And people only really care about themselves. So if you want to follow a path that not many people have done before, um, and that's alien to, to most people, like you're gonna get stick for it, you're gonna get people saying you shouldn't do it or it's a bad idea or you're stupid. Uh, but like try not to let those thoughts enter your own thought process. Uh, because at the end of the day, those people don't really care. They don't go home and lie away thinking about you on that weird journey. Yeah. You know, at night. Like they go home yeah. and think about their you know, their own stuff. Yeah. You know, so that that's you now that's useless piece of advice to somebody who does care about what other people think, but hopefully one day you know, those people can get around that. In the long run, if you, if you yeah. didn't care what they think, you would try more, you would execute more, like you said before. That's it. But something that it just from, if we just, to, if I was to wrap up your journey so far, and I'm sure there's unbelievable, crazy 
stuff to come if we sat down again in 10, 20 years, connecting the dots backwards, as we said, is I love reading autobiographies. That's something that, that just, I first of all, started off with sport autobiographies uh, and into other ones. And every single person that's been massively successful, if, if we actually relate it to, I used to love soccer. I used to watch every single, every single thing to do with soccer. I used to play championship manager, play FIFA, know all these players. In the last number of years, I've kind of put it to one side and I wouldn't have as much knowledge. But I used to be obsessed with looking at wonder kids because the championship manager, there was basically a wonder kid section and then see where, how they came on from that or seeing kids that st made their debut at 16 or 17 in soccer and then they'd randomly pop into your head and even to this day I Wikipedia them to see where they're at. And with, the, with major, major exceptions, the amount of kids that have started at 16, 17 or 18 who have seemed to have everything going for them and then actually become a world superstar was very, 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 very small. The people who become world superstars, uh, if just for example, Cristiano Ronaldo, obviously he had talent, mm. but he worked on it every single day. Or for example, Michael Phelps, or for example, Usain Bolt. They weren't, like sometimes in a story, they were, if you look at their autobiography, they weren't blitzing it when they were as a teenager, but it was something that they, they had talent, and they saw there was a market there for them, and they kept working, they stuck to it, stuck to it, stuck to it, and then they became something something massive. And that seemed, that seems to be similar to the, the, the direction the growing skill goal there's you started learning from mistakes you kept kept going you kept executing kept executing uh, and for me anyway it's been an absolutely fantastic really inspirational thought-provoking uh, chat with you today and thanks very much for Cheers. coming in an honor to be here thank you very much for having me back uh, great cool so just one before we go one thing to shout out is uh, I'm not sure if you can see this t-shirt that was made for me here it says King Louis the Great on it it's made for me by a couple of growing school students in third year science Absolutely blown away with us. Thank you so much for that, and thanks very much for listening. Uh, yeah, good. Thanks, man.